Hi everyone, my name's Anton Smith. I'm Director of Product at Spectra Cloud. I'm going to talk to you today about something I find extremely interesting and I hope that you're going to enjoy it too. It's going to be all about on-prem costs and how to slash them and unleash the beast. So let's jump straight into it. A little bit more about me. I'm a networking nerd. Uh, basically all my career I've spent uh, working with networking and other infrastructure related technologies. Last three years or so, I've been working on Kubernetes and OSS. I spent some time at Canonical, where I was actually the product manager for Maz. That's why I love talking about Maz or Metal as a Service. Um, I love Stone Temple Pilots, and I'm currently the director of product management at Spectra Cloud. Okay, so looking at the agenda, what I've got for you today is, first up, let's actually explore the control plane conundrum. Um, why do we have this problem with bare metal as opposed to what we have in the cloud? After that, I've got a solution section where I want to talk about some of the different ways that you can solve that. And then I'm going to show you a demo of one way to solve it. So in order for this discussion to be more meaningful, we should also just revisit why people, why are we here? Why are people doing on-prem and why are we talking about on-prem and bare metal? Um, I won't go through all of these. I just want to touch on a few reasons, some of the biggest ones. I think the biggest one is probably around data sovereignty data security and compliance. This is simply where some uh, companies or organizations don't have any choice. They actually need to have it on premises. Take for example, COVID data in Iceland. They don't have any data centers from Google Cloud or AWS in Iceland. So they actually had to process it on premises. They, they were not allowed to take it out of Iceland. Um, there's performance and latency as well, processing things near to where the data is generated, intellectual property protection, it's another big one. Um, and then finally, organization, culture, and skill set. In short, there's many reasons why an organization might choose to do on-prem. Now, the trick is when you do on-prem, how do you do it well and get all the benefits that we get from the cloud? Now, just taking that one step further, we should also talk about why bare metal Kubernetes. Uh, there are quite a lot of reasons, and performance is not the main one. There are actually several other reasons that are more important to do or why it's better to do bare metal Kubernetes. Now, the first one is that resource efficiency is better. You're not slicing up hardware into VMs and then putting them together again and making a cluster out of it. Uh, you should be able to run around 10 to 20% more uh, workloads using bare metal instead of VMs. The total complexity is a bit lower because you don't have multiple orchestrators at work and in some cases, perhaps competing with each other. So take, for example, uh, vMotion, trying to do things at the same time as your Kubernetes cluster is trying to organize resources. Uh, every host is guaranteed to be a physical machine. And that's good because you have more direct access to the hardware. The cluster is able to read data more meaningfully. There's no sort of shield between it and the actual hardware, meaning that when you're on-prem and you have to manage all of that hardware, it becomes easier to get visibility on it. You get very fine-grained control over resources. So you can use the Kubernetes resource management um, capabilities as they're intended without something under the hood, perhaps CPU over subscription or noisy neighbor where you have VMs next to each other that are actually competing for resources. And you don't have to do things like CPU pinning uh, in order to deal with that problem. Um, so with that said, I think that there are many reasons to do bare metal Kubernetes. It doesn't mean that there's a right and a wrong and that you have to pick one or the other. But in some cases, people will choose to, to use bare metal Kubernetes. Now, finally, there's another one there, accelerators as well. It's also easier to pass things through like GPUs and stuff or just use them directly in Kubernetes rather than having to fiddle around with the VM layer. Okay, so there are definitely reasons to do bare metal Kubernetes uh, or bare metal in general. But there are also some big challenges. And what I'm going to talk to you about now is one that I call the bare metal control plane conundrum. And if we look at that, that arises because of the way Kubernetes is built. By default, it uses something called etcd or etcd, which is the uh, key value store for Kubernetes. And this is found on the control plane nodes in the cluster. These are the ones that decide where all the workloads in the entire cluster are going to go. Now, you have two options here. You have a single control plane plus single node control plane cluster where you have only a single box. You also have high availability clusters, which most people want to have in production. And you always need, at a minimum, three nodes for that high availability control plane. So what does that mean? 
So let's talk a little bit about what that means in different types of sites. At Edge, it doesn't really mean much. You're going to have to run your control pane and your workload side by side, especially if you only have one or three nodes, for example. Um, however, for medium and large, it's a bit more meaningful and a bit more nuanced because there are different things we can do. Now, first, I want to illustrate to you exactly what happens when you try to run multiple clusters on bare metal in a situation like a medium or a large data center. Okay, so let's take a look at large sites first. Now, in a large site, I'm just going to go with a contrived scenario of 900 machines and one and 100 clusters. Now, let's say we go there, we create 100 clusters. We want them all to be highly available. So there's 100 highly available control planes. And that means that in total that 300 of those are going to be control plane nodes. So out of the 900, we lost one third to the control plane and only two thirds is available for the workers. And if we dive in a little bit more detail there, then what we're gonna see is actually a lot of resource wastage. So just to hit that home, assuming that these servers each have 128 cores and 512 gigabytes of RAM, then that would mean that there's 38,400 cores allocated just to control plane and 150 terabytes of RAM. Now, clearly this is not the best way to use these resources, right? We want as much as possible of these machines to be focused on actual workloads that are related to the, to the business. So what about medium sites? Here it's even more difficult, I would say, because medium sites could be somewhere around nine to 12 hosts. And I'm going to use nine here just to really il illustrate the point. So at a minimum, three of these machines have been lost for the control plane, and we have very limited flexibility and limited options. And as a trick question, how many HA clusters could you actually build here? Now I'll just show you. So if we take one control plane here with three nodes, and we take another one, there's only three nodes left. We can't actually build any more highly available control planes. So we'd only end up with two clusters and only three out of the nine machines would be doing workloads. There's actually a much better way to do this, um, and I'm gonna show you that now. So what we'd like to do is move to control plane pools. So instead of all of those red nodes being taken fully one third, we do this. We end up with approximately 5% of the nodes being allocated for control planes. But how can we do that while also observing things like availability zones? Because in a data center of this size, you most likely want to have those. So the wanted position in an abstract way looks like this at the end. About 5% of the nodes we want to hold back for control plan, and that's entirely up to the organization. I've just picked 5% for today. It could actually be less when the machines are so powerful. And you want the majority of it to be available for uh, worker nodes. And so what you'd end up with here is this uh, slice of the machines would host all of the control planes. And this is what we call control plane pooling. So I could put them into a resource pool and then all the rest of the machines will stay as bare metal worker nodes. Okay, but how can we do this? Um, I'm gonna talk about three different types of solutions today. Um, one is virtualization, the other is heterogeneous hardware, and the other is allowing workloads on control plane nodes. Now. With virtualization, there are pros and cons to it. So the pros are that you have full freedom to allocate resources flexibly, and it's easy to move the control planes around. Um, the cons are that you need a virtualization solution, and there's no bare metal management. Most virtualization solutions don't give you a bare metal fleet management uh, system. And of course, you have licensing and other types of costs associated with the virtualization solution. Now, heterogeneous hardware, here you can right size the hardware. So what you're saying, what you say is, I'm going to actually allocate or buy separate machines, like smaller boxes, which are right sized for the control plan function. They're not big 128 core things. The problem with that is that it requires managing different types of hardware, which is gonna mess up your logistics and your spare parts management, for example, as well as being inflexible. So if on day one I said, I want to have 100 clusters, and then day two I say, I want to have 200 clusters, I can't easily go and just deploy another set of control plane nodes. And then finally, allowing workloads on control plane nodes, 
which is a common technique and is absolutely necessary at the edge where you don't really have any choice, it does give you more flexible usage of resources, but at scale in a large data center, this is actually untenable. It will create very messy operations and it can create resource contention requiring you constantly to be performing very careful management. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna dive a little bit more into virtualization. That's a bit the topic of the day today. How can we do that together with bare metal management? So imagine that I told you that you can just have this sprinkling of virtualization um, plus full bare metal lifecycle management for all of the machines and without the costs and the complexity. And here's the solution that I'm gonna talk about today and show you in a demo. So it's called MAS, Metal as a Service. Now the thing that a lot of people don't know is that MAS can actually do VM management as well in a lightweight way. And that lightweight way is using LexD, another canonical project that allows you to manage VMs on machines on Linux boxes. Now. The setup then that we're going to end up is we're going to build a control plane pool which has VMs that are managed by MAS together with LexD and we're going to have another pool where we keep bare metal workers. So this is going to give us the control plane pooling and avoiding the overutilization of hardware for control plane. Now MAS also has an API, a very rich API. It has Terraform. It has a CAPI provider that was built by Spectral Cloud and is open sourced as well. And it also has a beautiful UI that you're going to see later on. So when people normally ask me what MAS does exactly, uh, which was interesting party conversations, I said it does this. It puts operating systems onto empty boxes. So imagine I gave you a USB stick and it's your first day on the job at a data center and, and I asked you to take that USB stick and put Ubuntu on all 900 of those machines. Well, there is a better way and that's basically what MAS does. MAS works with a wide range of different hardware. It's open source, and you can build and provide your own custom images, or you can take some of these operating systems where they publish nice images or ways to build images for you. But bare metal is not only about provisioning. Day zero and day one matters, but as we know from Kubernetes, it's not enough. Day two is actually where it gets really hard. It's kind of like running a marathon. So MAS doesn't just provision operating systems onto boxes. It does a really wide range of other functions that are all about day two. And the thing is with hardware, you have to manage the hardware. It has physicalities to it, obviously. But there are things like hard drives failing or new boxes coming that need to be set up or boxes replaced. So MAS offers all the day two capabilities that are needed to manage bare metal. So the first is obviously that it has uh, automation. Uh, it has a number of APIs or it provides an API upstream, but it also works with a number of other APIs to work with devices. So it can manage, say, the power or do network booting or provide um, network services with IPAM, DHCP, and DNS. It's also very fast. Um, it only takes a couple of minutes to completely provision a new box. It has inventory management so that you're able to see every single device that is in the data center, every single graphics card, every single network card, the serial numbers, the drives, etc. And this is very important when you're dealing with, say, hard drive failures. Uh, it supports storage layouts and it importantly also supports hardware testing, which means that you can test boxes before you declare them ready to become part of the data center. Now, it also supports bare metal DevOps. So as I mentioned, it has uh, Terraform, but it also has Ansible, Chef, and uh, Juju support, which is also from Canonical. It has a Python binding, which is very nice to work with. It provides network monitoring. It provides LDAP integration. It also has support for composable systems like Cisco UCS, HP Moonshot, and more. And it also supports cloud metadata or cloud init, which is actually some of the secret source for supporting uh, CAPI with Kubernetes. Now, lastly, it also supports this KVM micro cloud integration, which is LexD. Now that KVM management is provided by LexD. So there's an integration out of the box. When you deploy boxes with MAS, you can actually choose to simply enable LexD. Uh, so this gives you virtual machine and system container management. It's Linux based. It has itself a very rich API, which is what MAS uses to integrate with it. 
It has very flexible storage and network configurability. It's easily deployable by MAS and it's very easily managed by MAS, which I'm going to show you. All right, time for the fun stuff, demo time. So what, do you, what I'm going to show you today is uh, based in my home lab, so I'm going to be keeping it small. Unfortunately, I don't have 900 servers uh, under my desk. I have six. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a resource pool, Bear 1, Bear 2, and Bear 3. These are three uh, physical machines that are going to be added into the control plane pool. And on each one of those, I'm going to create three VMs. And I will use these VMs to draw or create a control plane three times. So there'll be three control planes, one, two, three. And I will take one machine from this resource pool down here called WP or worker pool, M1 through M3, and I'll allocate one of those machines as a worker to each one of those clusters. So at the end of it, what you're going to see is uh, three clusters. Uh, each one will have a highly, availability, highly available virtualized control plane and each one will have one worker node in it. Now, I will also be using uh, CAPI together with MAS. So the CAPI, uh, open source CAPI project by Spectral Cloud, uh, I'll be calling that using our palette tool. Uh, and this will integrate with the MAS API and do all the magic. And so at the end, you're going to end up seeing this. You'll see, as I described, one cluster here drawn across the availability zone. So it has one virtualized worker uh, control plane in each of the three availability zones. And then we'll replicate that three times and they'll get one worker node each. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is take a look at the MAS interface. I'm gonna give you a really quick tour. What you're looking at right now is the machines page. So this is showing all the machines that we have available to us. Um, bear one, bear two, bear three, uh, as I said, I've prepared them. I also have M1 through M3 available. Now all of them are in the status called ready, which means that they're actually available to be used and provisioned. We can see things like how many cores and how much RAM they have available on them. Um, as I mentioned, this is my home lab, so they're not gigantic boxes, but they're big enough for today. We can see the KVM section over here, which is where we would be able to manage the hosts and create VMs if we want to. Um, and if you click on one of these boxes, let's take a look at bear1.maz. You can see lots of like awesome information about storage, memory, uh, how many CPUs it has. We can initiate tests on this. Um, we can see how the power, because we need to power cycle the boxes. We can see how that's managed. In this case, it's done through webhook. There's networking information available here and uh, also other system information here. Now, of course, we have more detail if we want to go into storage. We can see, all the, as I mentioned, the inventory, all the PCIe devices. We can see USB interfaces. We can see the results of what we call commissioning in MAS. These are a bunch of tests. You can also define your own tests, but even things like capturing LLDP information from the network to see what else is there is saved here. And so all you would need to do is go and look at the details of this test or the outputs, and uh, you can see everything that's going on. Now in this case, there wasn't so much because I don't have anything on my network. Um, as well as logs uh, for the status of the machine. As you can see, I've been preparing this demo, so this machine has actually been used and has been recently released back to the pool of available machines. So yeah, this is the MAS interface. And so now uh, I want to start showing you how to actually provision some of these machines. So the first thing that I want to do is also show you how to filter things. So I'm using a tag today demo. So I can easily filter on a whole bunch of information here, which is super nice. These are the six machines, as I mentioned. Now let's grab all of them. One, two, three, bear one through bear three. And we simply say, I want to uh, deploy those machines. So remember, I need to deploy Ubuntu on them to like bootstrap LexD so we can then create the virtualized machines. So all I have to do actually is select register as MAS KVM host with LexD, just like that. And I'm totally fine with Ubuntu 2204 for today. I could also select other kernels if I wanted to do something special or other types of operating systems, including custom images. But I'm not going to do that right now. 
If I did want to provide some cloud init data, I can do that here. But right now, I'm just going to start these machines deploying. And straight away, what you see is that it's starting to power on the machines. And as part of this boot process, because Maz is managing the network, it's actually going to intercept their DHCP requests and it's going to initiate Pixie boot. Now, all of these machines are configured to use Pixie when they boot up, and that's how they're going to get their operating system installed. Okay, so after a while, about five minutes, all these machines have been deployed with Ubuntu, which is uh, really cool. They're all on and they're all available. Now, they've also all had LexD installed on them automatically for us, so we can go straight to the KVM tab here. And if we click that, we actually see each one of those hosts is available as a LexD host, and we can see that they have some resources available that we can use to create VMs. So let's check out Bear one and go to KVM settings. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to overcommit the CPU a little bit just so I don't have any problems with number of cores. Now, you probably wouldn't do this in production, but you could if you wanted to. I just have to do it because of my lamp. Now that we're all set up with that, I can go to virtual machines, and here I can actually start to create machines. So I'm going to add a VM, and I'm going to call this bare one cp one I'm going to take two cores, two gigs of RAM, and I think 30 gigs of space should be more than enough. And I'll compose this machine, and then what's going to happen is that Maz is actually going to automatically commission it, and we will see a new machine pop up in the machine listing page that says it's ready for usage. Okay, so back on the machine listing page, we can see that that machine that we just created, that virtual machine, and here you also see very nicely that it's LexD because of the power driver, is currently commissioning. So Maz still does this process that it calls commissioning, which is discovering what it needs to know about the machine. Even though it did actually create it itself, it was actually created by LexD. So Maz still needs to go through the same process that it treats uh, physical machines with LexD machines. Now, I'm going to run away and configure all the other machines, and then we're going to come back and we're going to see them all in this list when they're ready. So here you see uh, I'm looking at the three control plane nodes that we're creating on Bear one uh, Two of them are currently in progress. Now, if you want to allocate those to a resource pool, you simply click here and you can allocate it. Uh, now, also as a zone, so I'm grouping by zone right now. So uh, all of these are going to be in AZ1. So as I allocate those, oops, that was not the right one to allocate there. I want each one of these control plane nodes. So I take this and I put that into AZ1. And then I also take this and put that into AZ1. Now we're going to use the, the zones later uh, to do placement of these and ensure that the clusters are built across the availability zones. The actual... Um, hosts themselves, I'm not going to put into a resource pool or a zone because we're not going to be using them uh, directly. Now, as for the worker machines, that's M1 through M3 here, I am going to allocate those. So let's uh, put all of them into the worker pool, like this, like so. And they're not in an AZ yet, so they don't move around, but I will. So let's put them into uh, availability zones as well. So M1, let's put that into zone 1. M2, let's put that into zone 2. And M3, let's put that into zone 3. And so now you see these uh, availability zones are starting to populate. And so here we actually have uh, everything in zone 1 ready to be used to be part of a cluster. Now I need to go and complete the rest of this for the other availability zones and I'll be right back. Okay, I've completed that and you can see all the machines currently going through commissioning and uh, testing phase. They've all been created and added to the right uh, resource pool and the right AZs. So in a little bit these are going to be ready and we can start building clusters. Okay, so that's finished. They are all ready right now, and they're all turned off and just ready and waiting. They're in the right control plane, uh, in the right pools, and they're in the right zones. Now, uh, just a quick flashback to the slide so you can take a look at that. 
what we've done is we've prepared bear one, two, three. We've got three VMs on each one of those, and we've got our worker machines, our bare metal machines ready. So it's time for us to look at the CAPI part of this and start creating some clusters. All right, so I'm going to use Palette, uh, the tool built by SpectroCloud for managing Kubernetes clusters. Uh, this is the console. You can see my testing from the previous couple of days, a bit of historical information there about my clusters. Uh, really quickly here, we have the concept of uh, cluster templates, uh, cluster profiles, we call them. I've prepared one in advance called Maz Bear Demo. Uh, this is going to deploy Ubuntu using Maz. It's going to deploy Kubernetes 1.28.3. It's going to deploy Calico, and I'm going to use Longhorn uh, for the storage. So a fairly basic uh, cluster profile here. So in order to create a cluster, we simply come in here and we say add new clusters, uh, add new cluster. Now in my case, I'm going to select a MAS type. We also have others like AWS, etc., but we are focusing on MAS today. And uh, I have also created something called a gateway, but we don't need to talk about that right now. And let's give this cluster a name. So let's give it the name Bear Demo Cluster 1. And we go to Next. Now we select the profile, which is Maz Bear Demo. And we get an overview. I have a chance to override some of the settings in here if I want to. And now the important part, we come to the cluster config. So right here, we have the master pool and the worker pool. Now I want three nodes. Remember, we want a HA uh, cluster. We don't want the worker capability on there because we're using VMs behind the scenes. And here I can actually specify the resource pool and the AZs. And you see it's picked these up uh, from MAS, which is great. So I'll take the CP resource pool. I will enable each one of these because I do want to have it uh, spread across those AZs. And I'll change the CPU and the memory down to match the resources that I created earlier. Now, in terms of the worker pool configuration, here I just want one node. Um, so I take the resource pool. WP, and I'm going to take AZ1 because remember we had one of our bare metal machines in there. And this looks good to me, so I can just continue next. Uh, there are some other options in here, like uh, keeping the operating system up to date, enabling scans, scheduling backups, RBAC control. I actually do want uh, something here, so I want to make sure that I will be a cluster admin on this cluster. Once it's finished, so I'll add that there, and now we'll validate this. And what's going to happen is it says it looks good. And now I say finish the configuration. And what's going to happen now is that it's going to start working with MAS, uh, the MAS that has uh, managed all of the is, is managing all of these machines, and it's going to actually start creating a cluster. Okay, great. So after all of that, and you've seen all the little spinning dials and things working while we were watching, we'll end up with this, which is three clusters all running quite happily. Bear demo cluster one down to bear demo cluster number three. They've got four healthy nodes each, which is the control plane, three control plane nodes each, and one worker node. And if we drill into one of those, we just take a look at, say, number three here. We can see some more information. We can see that it's healthy. There's some things going on in the reconciliation because it works via CAPI, if, if you recall. Uh, we can see the stack here that we deployed. We can see uh, CPU and, and memory usage in total. And if we click on nodes, we can actually see all three of these here. And the host names here, bear3, cp2, bear2, cp1, bear1, cp2, and m3 here. Now, the reason why some of these are not matching exactly is because we only said that they're in different AZs. There's no guarantee that all of the control plane nodes are going to be numbered exactly the same. They're in a pool within an AZ, so they can be taken dynamically.
And uh, so that means that these clusters are nice and happy right now and ready to start taking workloads. And we'll take a final look here at MAS, and we can actually see that all of the machines here in the different AZs have been um, allocated and deployed. They're all running the a custom image that we've uh, created, and uh, this um, satisfies all of the needs of CAPI. These are Kube ADM clusters under the hood. And we can also see the memory allocation, storage, and so forth, as well as the resource pools, worker pool and control plane. So that's a very successful uh, setup of three healthy clusters. Okay, and so with that, what we have seen the clusters being built, uh, we've created a control plane pool using virtual machines without any commercial software whatsoever. Extremely simple with all the best of bare metal management as well, with complete flexibility to divide things between a control plane pool with virtualization, availability zones, resource polling, as well as having worker nodes running on bare metal. So pretty much what I described to you earlier about a data center where you wanted to divide things flexibly and easily, and even in medium sites as well, I hope that you've seen in this demo that that was really nice and easy. I will also add that we at Spectra Cloud use this technique ourselves. We use it to get better utilization of our hardware in our labs during development and testing. And we have a lot of interesting discussions with different customers who are also investigating the same way of approaching things without getting into purchasing expensive licenses for commercial software. So again, they want the best of both worlds to mix and match virtual machines and bare metal flexibly without the complexity of multiple different solutions. So with that, I will just pull up this uh, next slide with a couple of few QR codes. Um, I would encourage you to try MAS. So go to MAS.io. They have a nice tutorial that'll let you try it just on your own laptop if you're running Linux. Uh, follow us on, on LinkedIn. We're always posting a ton of articles, interesting things, not just about bare metal, about almost anything Kubernetes. And then finally, you can find our resource center with the bear icon there. And in the resource center, all you have to do is tick bare metal and you will find all of the articles that we've written about bare metal, which is quite substantial, as well as all the other materials that we've created. Now, one final tip, uh, add me on LinkedIn as well and uh, send me a message. I'd love to hear what you thought about this presentation as I'm always looking to improve, uh, as well as any thoughts and general ideas that you had around it. And the very final, final tip, I get my hardware, in case you're wondering how I have six servers under my desk, I find it on eBay. I just find some old uh, small enterprise machines, that, the type that strap on the back of people's monitors, and I just buy those and add a bit of extra memory and storage, and then I'm able to manage them with mass, which is really nice to have your own lab. So with that, I'm going to say adieu, and I hope that you have a fantastic day and that you really enjoyed this presentation.